Welcome to Cryptids Canada. I hope everybody is having a wonderful day. Happy Independence Day for all of my American friends. I'm happy to say I've turned my spare bedroom into a printing room. I bought shelves and I've set up my two new printers. And I'm already starting to print out a lot of stuff that my son needs because he does these big shows and... What he makes with the printers sells out really super fast. So I'm trying to help him get caught up because he's got a few big shows coming. Anyways, it's just really super exciting. And it's nice that uh, I can do this and not be stressed out over it. Honestly, I can say that I am not bored. Every day I'm learning something new and that's great. I feel good about it. Okay, enough of the jibber-jabber. Let's get to the story. Hello, I sent in my story shortly after you started, but I don't believe you read it. I actually lost my ability to go online for quite some time. Luckily, I sent a copy of the story to my stepdad so he could look it over before I sent it to you. The bottom line, Leslie, is I really just want people to know there are things in our woods that are extremely dangerous for mankind. And I don't know why, but it seems like they are being protected. So anyways, here's the email that I sent you originally. I've listened to many channels over the years and enjoyed those stories, but I started living the stories when I started listening to your channel. So I've written the story out several times by email, and then I wrote it out on paper and put it in an envelope and addressed it to you. Then I ended up tearing it up. I know in my heart and soul what I'm writing happened to me. I've witnessed over the years just how cruel people can be, especially when they hear something that isn't their opinion. I only want to divulge that my story happened in Colorado in the early 90s. I had terrible anxiety and bouts of depression as a teen. I lost my dad at a young age and it affected me terribly. I started to spend more and more time alone, resisting my family and friends' advances to help me. At first, I spent a lot of time alone in my room. Then I started taking long walks in the woods, and my family thought I was starting to heal. So they started leaving me alone about it and even supported it. Then my long walks turned into one night alone in the woods, then two, and so on. I started collecting outdoor survival equipment, making my time in the woods much more enjoyable. I worked all week long in my grandfather's garage, and I'd come home Friday night at five, and I was already packed and on my way. My grandfather would come with me now and again, but he knew I preferred to be on my own. My family started to accept that this was who I was, and that the outgoing young man that I used to be was dead, as my father was. And now I had become quite comfortable in the woods, where I spent all my free time. It was perfect because I could drive up to the old abandoned service road, park my truck, and walk a couple of miles or so into the woods. It was secluded, and it was on a big creek with big gorgeous brown trout that I loved so much. It was my grandfather's favorite place too, which was why I relented and let my grandfather in on my secret place. At first, it was fine because Grandpa was completely respectful of my feelings. If I wasn't in the mood for company, then he stayed away. That's why I was so disappointed in him when he told an old friend of mine how to find me. I was sitting at my fire, cooking the brown that I had caught for dinner, with a side of wild rice, my all-time favorite, when I started hearing footsteps coming through the woods. 
I froze and just listened. And then I heard my name being called. I called back, yeah, I'm over here. I waited and I listened as the footsteps got closer and closer. Out of the woods walks my childhood best friend and two girls that I'll call Peter, Paulette, and Mary. LOL. For you young ones, Peter, Paul, and Mary was the name of a group of singers in the 60s, I believe. I had never met these girls before, and as for Peter, he moved away right before my dad died in the seventh grade. As far as I was concerned, we were now complete strangers. So needless to say, I was not all impressed that he had found me, nor was I impressed with my grandfather, who gave him the directions to my campsite. I will admit I was amused when he walked out of the woods. I was shocked to see him, and I hugged him back when he hugged me. He made the introductions all around and proceeded to pass out beers and bark orders at the girls on where they should place the tents. I had just arrived a couple of hours earlier. I had just dropped my equipment and went to fish immediately. There were no signs of rain, so I was perfectly fine sleeping under the stars beside the fire. And since the one girl was placing her tent right where I usually put mine, it looked like I was indeed going to be sleeping under the stars. I could tell within an hour that my peace and quiet was definitely not going to be reciprocated. Peter was acting like he was there to save the day. He let it slip that one of my family members had contacted his parents after my dad died, hoping they could get Peter to cheer me up by calling me. And he opened his arms up for a big hug, saying, I'm here for you now, buddy. I just couldn't help myself by laughing. I said, dude, it's been 10 years. You're a little late, don't you think? Then his girlfriend slobbered. Geez, have a little decency. He's here now. Isn't that what matters? I was seething mad, but I thought I would just sit here beside the fire and wait for them to pass out. And then I would gather up the few things that I had unpacked and I would walk back to my truck. I would decide then what to do next. I was relieved that there was a decent sized moon to see a bit better by. It didn't take long for them to go to bed and I split. I had to use my flashlight because some of the woods were too thick to see by the moonlight. I'd only walked for about 10 minutes when I heard trees smashing from behind me. Fear started to rise into my chest. If it were daytime, I would have believed they were lumberjacks, but not at 1 a.m. I started walking faster now, and I started hearing grunting and stomping. I was starting to believe that it was a big bear, and fear took over me. I started to run, and whatever it was decided to run after me. I saw ahead of me a fallen tree that wasn't laying on the forest floor. There was at least a foot underneath the tree that was home to a million dead leaves. I flew into that pile and I covered myself back up with the leaves that were all around me. I held my breath and I listened to the large being still running towards me. And within seconds, it jumped on the tree that I was hiding under. Then it used the tree like a diving board and it sprung itself forward and kept running after me, supposedly. I listened as it kept running further away. I was surprised that I was able to hide from whatever it was. I was also surprised that my hiding spot was quite comfortable, so I just decided to stay there until morning. The sound of the monkeys playing or interacting was what woke me up in the morning. I opened my eyes and I looked around. I could see it was a den of sorts. Something had burrowed out the dirt from under the huge log. There were a few dead pine branches that were probably used for laying on. I couldn't quite sit up all the way, but it was comfortable. I followed the sound of the commotion, and I found a small area that I could see out the other side of the fallen log, where it met the forest floor, except the tree was right at the edge of a small cliff. It looked like a dry creek bed. The floor of the creek bed was about 15 feet below me, maybe a little more. A 
Across from me, it looked like there was a large area that was dug out or washed out from the creek. So if you were standing across the creek from me, looking towards me, you would never know you were standing directly above a carved out cave that was home to four giant monkey looking creatures. I watched as they talked in their language. They squealed and hooted at each other. Two of them were females and one was a young male and the other one was a big male. I couldn't take my eyes off of them. What in God's name was I looking at? Then the name Bigfoot came to me. I knew nothing about Bigfoot, but I knew I wanted to know more. I watched as they laid down and the last female pulled broken branches over the opening of their cave. I left a few minutes later. I was careful to cover the opening of the dugout tree. I didn't want anything discovering my new hiding spot. I kept watching my compass because I was coming back for sure and I didn't want to forget the directions. I found my way back to my truck and was quite surprised to see Peter was standing there waiting for me. He had quite a bit to say to me about my rude behavior and how he went out of his way to find me in my hour of need. I shook my head and I said, I don't know why you think I'm in my hour of need, but if it was, you would be the last person I would reach out to. Then I got in my truck and I drove away. I called my grandfather when I got home and he asked if I liked my surprise. I won't go into detail, but put it this way, if he didn't know then, he sure knows now. I like my privacy and it's very important to me. So I went back up the next weekend because I wanted to be sure that Peter, Paulette, and Mary were gone. I also wanted to find out as much information as possible. Believe me, there wasn't that much back then. I went back to my original spot and sure enough, they had left broken beer bottles and garbage everywhere. So I cleaned up and I put up my tent and then I went in search of my tree. It was about a 10 minute walk from my campsite. If you were standing beside the opening of the downed tree, you couldn't see through to the other side of the dry creek because of all the thick brush. But when you climbed under the downed tree and scurried up the length of the tree, you had a small opening where the dirt had fallen away from the bank and you could see across the creek bed. I got into my position and I saw the opening across the creek was covered in dead branches. So I just laid there watching. Then out of nowhere, a dead deer fell directly in front of the opening and scared me half to death. Then the big male jumped down, landing right beside the deer with a loud thump. The branches were pushed aside and there were quiet squeals of excitement and gibberish talk as they proceeded to pull the deer apart limb by limb. The male used its fingers to rip open the stomach, and then it pulled out the guts and tossed them aside. He ate the heart and liver, and after that I lost track. I watched till it was getting dark. When they were through, they started climbing the bank to the other side. That scared me, so I hurried back to my campsite. This is the beginning of a very long few months or so. Periodically, I wondered what had chased me that first night. Was it another Bigfoot? Was it one of my Bigfoot? I didn't know until the last weekend that everything changed for me again. I always went over to my tree about four or five o'clock. Sometimes they were already awake, but usually not. I would always spy on them for a while as they were getting ready to go and hunt or do whatever they did on the other side of that creek. The last weekend I saw them, I went over on the Friday afternoon. As I was spying on them, waiting for them to wake up, I saw something that made me look up. And what I saw changed me far more than anything else. Standing on the edge of the cliff across the creek bed was two wolves. One was naturally on all fours, looking down over the side of the bank towards the lair of the four Bigfoot, and the other wolf 
was standing up like a human, holding on to the tree as it looked over the edge as well. They both appeared to be gray and black, with white streaks. Their eyes were dark, or really unnoticeable. It looked like they were stalking the Bigfoot, to be honest. At that moment, I wish I had a gun. I was getting scared because these creatures were as big as the Bigfoot, at least. I'm just guessing, but none of them, except for the juvie, could fit through the front door without bending over. I decided I'd better be off to my campsite now, rather than later. That night, long after I went to bed, I was woken up by screams so loud and terrifying that I covered my ears and rolled into a ball. Then the roaring and screeching began. It was constant. It sounded like a massacre was taking place. There were definite sounds of chimpanzees. Some of the sounds were up in the trees and some were on the ground. The trees weren't being spared either, even near me as well. I was kicking myself for not leaving. I knew all hell was going to break loose. I knew those wolves, or now I know them as dogmen. They were there to hurt the Bigfoot. This went on for hours. I didn't even stoke my fire. The last thing I wanted was to let them know I was there. Now I knew, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that it was a dogman who tried to get me that first night. They are ruthless killers, and there's no doubt in my mind that they could easily kill a human. The last of the noise ended a few hours before sunup. When I was dozing off, I forced myself to get up and go see what happened to my Bigfoot. I decided to pack up my camp and take everything with me when I went to see about the Bigfoot. I was closer to my truck from there anyways. Honestly, I was afraid to spend another night there. As I neared my fallen tree, I barely recognized the area. There were tree limbs everywhere. I did see a little blood here and there, but not much considering what I was expecting, and that was a bloodbath. I crawled under my tree, which was untouched, thank God, and I scurried up to the edge. I looked over at the beach on the other side, and it was destroyed. I saw what appeared to be fur and hairballs all over. The beach was dug up, but you could see areas where footprints were pushed back, ending in mounds. I was relieved to not see dead bodies. I was just about to leave when I heard an unmistakable growl. I stopped and I trained my ear. I listened, but I heard nothing. I looked out my peephole to the other side of the creek and then looked up to where I first seen the dog man. Then just above where I saw it, sitting on a limb above the lowest branch, he was sitting on his heels with his knees wide open while he held on to the tree trunk, steadying himself. He was looking directly at me or the peephole, but I'm sure he knew I was there. He stood on two feet and stretched. Then he jumped down, landing on two feet in a crouching position. Then he fell forward and pushed off, landing on his hands. He took off on his hands and feet, away from me towards the thick woods on his side. I too wasted no time. I came out of my den and I took off running for my truck. I went back once a week for about a month to check on the area. And believe me when I say I was packing. The last time my den was torn up, or dug up, I thought. That was enough. The weather was getting too cold anyway for camping, and nobody in their right mind wanted to spend time in the woods in the cold Colorado winters. At Thanksgiving, I decided to tell my family what happened in the last year. They laughed and said I needed to see a doctor, so I stopped talking to people about it. Except, of course, you. Please take care in these uncertain times. A fan. Oh my goodness, that was a great story. And I do vaguely recall bits and pieces of that, but I couldn't for the life of me find it. But in my opinion, it was a darn good story and I don't mind doing it again if I did do it originally. But I thank you for taking the time to send it to us. 
Okay, guys. Well, I think that's going to be it. If you have a story and you want me to read it, please send it in. Hit that like button and hit that bell for notifications of when I'm uploading a video. And subscribe. Thank you, guys. You know I love you. Bye for now.